excited to welcome you for the second day of this wonderful conference. Sofian and John, sit down. Come, welcome. So our first panel today is on gender, and I'm moderating, Leela Gandhi couldn't be here. Um, but our first presenter, I'm gonna read out the names, and um, Ilyas is gonna be coming when he presents. Uh, so our first is Rabi Alam ad -Din and George Aizzi. Oh, and Marsha is one. Hi, Marsha. Marsha's here from Yale. We're so excited for all of these people to be here, and thanks for coming. And I'm going to be very strict with time. First, an apology because I'm not an academic, so usually I have nothing to say. Uh, we like the non-academic. Mm. I, I, I was going to make the. Um, what I'm going to talk about for for me is the whole idea of of perception and perception of gender. Um, on Sunday night. I uh, had a dinner and a friend of mine was there and she is a scholar uh, of trans studies and gender studies and I told her uh, they, I was put on a panel for, for gender and she looks at me and goes, well, you do have one. <laughs> this was supposed to be a better job. <laughs> so uh, let's, let me start. Again, what I'm interested in is uh, about perception of gender. Yesterday, Maya was talking about how researchers come into uh, the Middle East for two weeks, uh, interview a few people, and then um, consider themselves experts. Uh, I'll, uh, I can tell stories about that, but what I'm also interested in is how we uh, in Lebanon, and those of us who are Lebanese and outside of Lebanon, still have our own biases, uh, and how I, I, what I do is I'll talk about me and what happened to me. Um, every time I get interviewed um, by the Western press, after almost every book that I've written, uh, I get asked the question, uh, you, it basically is a statement that I write about, you know, strong women, and why is that? Uh, and I always find the question interesting because uh, whenever I get interviewed by the Lebanese press or any Middle Eastern press, that question never comes up. It, it's not even part of the conversation and not only taken that way. I have in the book before the last one, almost every Lebanese woman I know identified with uh, the character of Fatima who basically goes down to the underworld and conquers the, the demons. And every woman that I've talked to, from my agent to my mother to my sister to all my friends, think that I base that character on her. <laughs> Yet for the Western press, they think that this is extraordinary. And I think that's about how we perceive and the biases that we have. Um, but that, to me, is less interesting as to the biases that I have, and I have to re-examine constantly. Um, for the last almost year and a half, I have been interviewing uh, Syrian refugees in Lebanon, uh, by, primarily right now for a story for the New York Times. Um, and I started talking to a lot of uh, refugees, and of course, Primarily, they're women. Uh, and a lot of it reinforced my, let's call them prejudices. Uh, for the most part, in the, the Syrian refugee women, uh, almost always, they're the ones who are working. It's not the men. The men can never find a job, uh, whereas the woman will take anything that she can to support the family. And I, that I sort of expected. Uh, again, it might not be Western expectations, but uh, I know from the way that I grew up that um, 
Lebanese or, or Syrian men, Middle Eastern men, have to get the right job. If they are a stonemason, they can't even imagine tilling the field, whereas the women did everything. Um, but then I started hearing these stories about gay and lesbian refugees and trans refugees. And that's where I started examining my prejudices. Because these, uh, particularly, my prejudices were involved uh, trans refugees. Because I always assumed that uh, you would be trans in a big city. Um, that it would only be in a big, modern, westernized city. And that turned out not to be the case at all. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to interview them, but I interviewed uh, this doctor who dealt, uh, who was basically a volunteer with the center. And I thought it was interesting what he had to say constantly, that there was this, uh, as an example, there's a trans woman who came from right outside of Deir Zur in Syria. Deir Zur is a town in Syria, and it's, shall we say, not the most advanced of towns. Uh, but she's not even from there, she's from a village. And what I thought was amazing was that she was completely accepted by the village that she was from. And that, to me, uh, again, reinforced my biases, or sorry, challenged me. And I started asking all these questions about her, like, you know, how was it possible and easy? She, you know, she took on a certain role, uh, and it was accepted. Uh, I asked, you know, what about hormone treatment? Uh, and she took pregnancy pills. Uh, and my favorite is that she lasted uh, quite a bit in the town and only came as a refugee to Lebanon when ISIS came in. And ISIS did not go after her, they killed her boyfriend. And I thought, to me, you know, again, it just, that she was almost, I mean, I assumed that she was accepted even by ISIS. It was her boyfriend who wasn't. Um, and then the most stunning thing for me was that she was a Muslim. And uh, at some point, uh, before ISIS came in, she b began to, what we call, take on her faith. And she wore a veil. So all the jokes that I think about of, you know, not having to put too much makeup is easier with a veil. Uh, again, my jokes aren't working today. <laughs> uh, but then, it, it, for me, what I, I had to look at is the perception that, and the biases that I have, that you know, for, I associate trans and being and living comfortably uh, that would, would have to be in a westernized city. And it turned out to be, for, amazingly, uh, just not true. So I had to constantly re-examine that. And one of the things that uh, I was interested in is that I was going to uh, interview her and um, write the story because I had <coughs> was going to do the story in, 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 in this fashion, which is uh, I had talked to this other woman who was uh, a straight woman who had breast cancer. And <coughs> she could not get um, any help for uh, radiation and chemo. She was able to get help for two surgeries, but not for radiation and chemo. And then when I talked to the Breast Cancer Foundation, they said that they, they won't be able to help because they only work with Lebanese. Whereas the trans woman was getting help from uh, gay organizations, basically. So I was, uh, I mean, that's another thing that I'm interested in, is why all of a sudden, uh, shall we say, gay and trans is sexy. Um, I, yeah. That uh, with, if this woman who had cancer uh, basically said that she was a lesbian, would she get help with chemo and radiation? Uh, and I, I thought that's a fascinating uh, 
issue. But then the organization that was helping her, um, when I talked to this guy and Maya down there, they explained to me that it's not as, shall we say, healthy as we see it. Uh, because it's a, it's a guy who's getting money for uh, uh, for helping you know gay and lesbians and and, uh, and trans people and uh, shall we say it's it's pimp international. The accusation is that he's pimping, uh, and I find that interesting. Again, that we've gotten to the point where. Um, our issue, our issues, all, all my perceptions are being challenged. Everything that I thought I knew or that I constantly find out gets re-evaluated. And after yesterday's talk where she, you know, Maya was going on about researchers, I actually think it's just more than researchers. It's us. It's what we read, how we see, uh, our, how we're represented in the media, that no matter what, even if I'm completely involved, I'm still biased. Um, and basically, that's all I had to say. I can cut it short. Would you like to say something about your own personal experience, your own story? Mm, it's boring. No, uh, actually, what I'd like to say is George and I were sitting uh, in the audience yesterday, and there was all these talks about Lebanon, and it, I was interested, again, that if, if you heard all, uh, if all you heard about gays in Lebanon was yesterday, um, you'd get a very different experience than mine. Uh, I mean, it, just for the simple fact that I've been out, out for, publicly out for about 30-something years, and I've never had a single problem, never. Uh, and again, I come somewhat privileged, I understand that, but it's also another aspect of you know, what it's like to be gay in Lebanon. Uh, when I wrote my first book, I assumed that I would be banned from the country, uh, that if I ever showed my face, I'd get beaten up and you know, all kinds of weird things, until I found out that no one reads. So n n no one gave a shit, not a single person. Uh, you know, and, and that to me was a fascinating thing. You know, uh, I remember that I was told that the president of, of Lebanon made fun of me at a dinner, and, and uh, Marwan Ahmed did this, this did, uh, but that's nothing. Uh, the whole idea for me was that you know I had these perceptions of that it's not okay to be gay in Lebanon, that it's not okay to be this until it's it wasn't my experience. Was that what you meant? By Is that what you meant, sir? I, I mean, I could talk about many different things. None of them are interesting. Well, we find them very interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you've you've lived with them, so you're used to them, but. Um, Thank you so much, and now we'll turn to our next speaker, George. In my presentation today, there's going to be two parts. The first part is I'll be speaking about gender from the LGBT perspective and discussing why the work on gender is fundamental to the work on LGBT issues in the MENA region. And the second part, I'll be speaking about the LGBT organizing in the MENA region currently and what are the major challenges facing LGBT activists. To understand the link between gender and LGBT issues, I will be presenting examples from four countries about the common practices against LGBT people. Technically, homosexuality is illegal across the MENA region, but there's a huge difference between the legal text and actual practice of the police. For example, Lebanon, Article 534, condemns unnatural intercourse to up to one year of imprisonment. The article doesn't mean much, actually, and recently there was a ruling in the court saying that homosexuality is not unnatural, how does this article apply? But this is the interpretation of the judge, it's up to the judge to decide. But the major issue is the police, how the police views or, or analyze this article. In, in the last two years, there were two raids, in, uh, one in the Hammam and one in a, a gay cruising cinema in Beirut. 
30 people were arrested, mostly foreign workers or people from lower economic classes. Once they were arrested, they were subjected to the anal testing or the homosexuality test. It's a test to verify if they were penetrated or not. Those who were not penetrated were released because they're not gay, and those who were, according to this unscientific test, were kept in prison. So while unnatural intercourse is not clear, for the police in Lebanon, it was clear that the guy who gets penetrated is the guy who is gay and should be arrested. This is the guy doing something unnatural. This guy is playing the role of the woman and therefore touching the, the, the image of the man, the, the supremacy of, of manhood in Lebanon. And the, the, therefore, this is the person who should be criminalized. When the INET tests were banned, the police were in, in a very delicate position. So how they can prove that now, because of the pressure from the media and from Halem, and the testing was banned in Lebanon last year. But the police was in a very uh, confusing position. However, they can prove now that this person is gay or not if they cannot do the any test. So what is a, a gay person? Um, we, I heard the, from one of the owners of a gay club uh, who was interrogated by the police. They asked him, so what kind of gays do they go there? They need to know if they go and arrest people there. Are they the good gays or the bad gays? And for them, the good gays were, you know, the average middle class, gender conforming uh, man, uh, gay men. The bad gays were the transgenders or those who identify as women. Another issue also we noticed in Lebanon, while Halim was working on, the, on a booklet for families, a guide for, family, uh, a guide for families of LGBT individuals, one common question that all the parents kept asking when they, the first question was, why is my son gay or why is my uh, daughter is a lesbian? But the second question is systematically, they really want to know if the son is a top or a bottom in the relationship. That was a really important information for the parents. It's, it's, it's in, in, the, in, the, in, in the testimonial of many gay men we, who came out to their parents, they all said that this was a question that was asked by the family. So in Lebanon, we say homosexuality is illegal, but technically what is illegal is a man to identify as a, as a woman and for a woman to express her non-conformity by rejecting her need to, to a man. Sudan. Uh, I was reading the constitution of Sudan and I thought they must have received a big grant from the UN to change their constitution because the text is amazing. The government guaranteed the equal rights between men and women in all levels. The government will combat all traditions that affect women's rights. Protection of women in, uh, through positive discrimination. This was in the Constitution of Article 32 of the Constitution of Sudan. But then I went to the penal code. The role of the state, Article 16, to create laws in order to combat corruption and social evil and elevate Sudanese society to a level that it conform with religion and cultural values. It is the responsibility of the government to preserve purity in this public sphere. A woman needs her husband's permission to work. And basically, the, the husband should approve the contract. So there's this big uh, conflict between the actual text and the penal code. Article 145, Liwat. The definition of Liwat, which we usually translate into homosexuality, but that definition is interesting, is anyone, any insertion of the penis in someone else's anus, being a man or woman. That, uh, that's the definition of free will. So basically, the, uh, the law in Sudan doesn't discriminate if it's, uh, if it's uh, anal sex between heterosexual or homosexual. However, between 2010 and 2013, all the men who were arrested in Sudan under this article were not engaging in sex. They were dressed like women, or they were engaging in immoral activities such as dancing. One of the guys was arrested because he was a model. And modeling is against, you know, uh, the, the, the man or the traditional cultural values of, uh, of, of Sudan. In Kuwait, you remember the whole uh, drama that happened around the homosexuality test that Kuwait is planning to, was planning to do, and I, I'm not sure if actually they're applying it. So there, there, there wasn't uh, the, the news about the homosexuality test, 
But what Kuwait meant by homosexuality again were the transgender and not the gays, not the, the gay men. Because Kuwait, even though they have a law that punishes homosexuality, they passed a law specifically condemning uh, people who dress as the other uh, gender. And their homosexuality test is basically testing mostly migrant workers to make sure that they're not transgender, that they actually are the other gender they, they, they present. In Iraq, again, the campaign against homo homosexuals, for them, a homosexual is any man who was dressed in a Western way. So a man wearing a, a red T-shirt can be viewed as homosexual and therefore arrested or beaten by, by the militias. So, in the context of the MENA region, combating homosexuality is important to preserve patriarchy. And uh, patriarchy is, is, becomes much more important in the, zone, in the areas of conflict. And usually in political instability, all the political discourse would be about preserving, you know, we need the man in our, in our country, homosexuals are a threat to our society and threat to patriarchy specifically. We've seen this in Egypt, uh, and I think there was a presentation yesterday in Egypt, where again, after, uh, after the Egyptian revolution, and Sisi came back to power, the obsession of Sisi was this, the manhood of Egypt, to, to, to preserve patriarchy and the manhood of, of, of the Egyptian man. And he started this whole campaign against LGBT individuals, but not only that, the campaign was not only against gay men or, or lesbian women, but also against women who were politically active, women who were uh, harassed and intimidated while going to a protest. So they usually, the, the, any homophobic activity by a government goes hand in hand with sexist activities. Homosexuality is also used as a tool to intimidate uh, Opposition in Tunisia, Munir Batu, the, Lib the, uh, the Liberal Party leader, was arrested for homosexuality in 2013. The idea, he was arrested in order to shame him. He's not a real man. He's not. He cannot lead the country. Algeria also recently launched a campaign against LGBT people, blaming them for being behind uh, the opposition. And there was a big online campaign uh, going into people's uh, Facebook profiles and showing them that the opposition are actually homosexual. And that was a way to uh, basically uh, discredit them. So in that context, how is LGBT organizing in the MENA region? Uh, there's currently around 13 organizations working on LGBT issues and gender issues in the, from an LGBT perspective in the MENA region. I think despite, despite uh, the Arab Spring turning into a very cold Arab winter, uh, there, there was this, there's still this hope and this need from young activists to push the boundaries. Even in Egypt, where there's an attack on civil society, they insist on organizing and trying to at least uh, make some changes in, uh, in their society. But this is not easy as, as a world. They're facing many challenges. One of them is the law. When I speak about the law, I'm not speaking about the law against homosexuality specifically. In Jordan, it's impossible to create an NGO. Having uh, the, the laws controlling civil society are too big for any organization to start. And this is why the fight for LGBT rights in Jordan goes through the right for civil society to organize as well. Media, media is also a big element in affecting the LGBT movement. To give an example of how, on how the media can play an important role, I will compare two situations. The first one is the, what I spoke about before, uh, the arrest in the Hammam in, uh, in Lebanon, and the gay wedding in Egypt. They happened around the same time. The arrest happened around the same time. Except the media in Lebanon back then was extremely supportive to the LGBT community, especially in fighting the uh, anal testing and presenting this as a rape. The media in Egypt was endorsing and condemning the, uh, the work of the police. So what happened after that, following the media reaction, the police in Egypt kept arresting people. The police in Lebanon, they had to take a step back and explain themselves and actually ban uh, 
the end of destiny. Uh, insecurity. The state is not always the issue. In the case of Iraq, Syria, and Tunisia also last year, non-state actors, militias who had the power to, to control. In, in Iraq, it's, if, if you change the law now in Iraq, there's no rule of law anyway. The people who are controlling uh, the society in Iraq are the militias, and they were the one leading the attacks against the LGBT community there. Overall, um, I, will, I will conclude here. The LGBT movement now in the, in, in the MENA region is a growing movement, but again, when we first started in Beirut, we started, we didn't have any example to follow. We were testing the field. We were trying different examples in different ways. And it's the same case for many activists across the MENA region in Egypt and Tunisia. Strategies change and uh, evolve uh, while, while working. And I just want to answer the question around, around academia. And I think that one of the biggest issues I felt when we were working in, uh, in, in Lebanon at the beginning is that we were really trying hard. We were doing our best, we were dealing with the police, we were dealing with, we were dealing with the attacks from society. And then every now and then there's an article coming somewhere from New York trying to criticize us for the work that we're doing and explain to us how we should be doing our work. Uh, this has created, and honestly, this is the first time I'm in this context of uh, academia. But uh, for the longest time, I was really allergic to the word academics. If you're coming from the academia, just <laughs> I, I don't need your advice. I mean, go back to your university and do whatever you're doing. But fortunately, this has changed because I'm meeting people who really want to listen to the activists and not prove a point uh, by you know, imp impressing, impressing their colleagues. And especially now in the MENA region, it's really important for activists to get all the support they can get and to learn from their experience on the field without getting you know, harsh criticism from people who are not there in these countries. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now we'll turn to Marsha Inhorn. Well, I feel, I feel so bad because I'm an academic and I hope there's no, I hope there's no allergic reaction going on, but um, at any rate. I, and in fact, I'm gonna talk about some sort of academic things to start off. I want to thank Saeed Afshan for inviting me to be here. I am so pleased to be here. I couldn't be here yesterday, but I'm very happy to be here. And I think it's a really path-breaking conference that you pulled together. So, you know, bravo to you. And it's nice to see Shireen Hamdi, a fellow medical anthropologist. So this is a panel on gender, and I want to speak about gender in the Middle East, and I want to do so from three vantage points. First, I want to speak about the world of Middle East gender studies and the engaged scholarship on sexuality and queer life that's beginning to emerge in this field. Second, I want to speak briefly about my own work in Middle East gender studies, including what I've learned about men's sexuality in the midst of infertile marriages. And then finally, I want to speak about queer imaginaries, particularly the ways in which new reproductive technologies emerging in the Middle Eastern region make possible biogenetic futures for gay people who want to parent. And I will reflect on some of the transgressive uses of technology, as well as the constraints in a region where the mandate of heterosexual marriage continues to delimit and preclude gay family life. And so to say something about Middle East gender studies, the field of Middle East gender studies has been thriving now for about 30 years. Um, in fact, 2014, last year, marked the 30th anniversary of the Association of Middle East Women's Studies, or AMUSE, and that was an organization founded by the Lebanese-American anthropologist, Suat Joseph, as well as a group of very committed feminist scholars and colleagues. Over the years, AMUSE has grown into one of the largest and most active affiliate organizations of the Middle East Studies Association, or MESA. And those of us who belong to AMUSE and MESA, we come from around the world, we work in a variety of different languages and on a diverse range of topics, and many of us do have activist commitments, including to the LGBT community and to human rights issues. I want to say a little bit about my own involvement because I'm very old. I was there at the beginning of AMUSE. I was there when it started back in 1984. But about 10 years ago, the AMUSE leadership decided to launch its own journal and because I was at the University of Michigan that time directing the Center for Middle East and North African Studies, they asked if we could locate JMUs at the University of Michigan. So JMUs, the journal of the Middle East Women's Studies uh, world, was founded in 2004. 
And then in 2008, I switched to a different university and we brought JMUs with me to that university. In April 2014, last year, we celebrated the 10th anniversary of JMUs with a special issue. So when we started the journal, we dedicated it to Middle East gender studies writ large in order to include both Middle Eastern masculinity and sexuality studies research. And so I, looking back over the first 10 years of JMUs, which I did this past week, I went through all the old issues, I can say that most of the scholarship on gender in the Middle East still focuses on women's lives and histories, or to be more specific, exactly 145 of the 155 articles published in JMUs over the past decade, or 96% focus on women. But the scholarship on Middle Eastern masculinity has definitely picked up since 2008, with 10 articles focusing on men's lives and manhood. Indeed, in the first decade of Jamie's existence, the most cited article, according to Project Muse, was Paul Amar's seminal theoretical piece called Middle East Masculinity Studies, Discourses of Men in Crisis, Industries of Gender and Revolution, which examines how circulating discourses, especially around the time of the Arab uprisings in 2011, played, to quote Amar, crucial roles in misrecognizing, racializing, moralistically depoliticizing, and class displacing emergent social forces in the Middle East. Now, one of these emergent social forces in the region is the increasingly visible gay movement in countries such as Lebanon and Turkey. And so in the same issue in which Amar published his theoretical essay on Middle Eastern masculinity, Jamie's published its first article on gay life in the region. And this is a piece by Jared McCormick, with the great title, Harry Chess Will Travel, Tourism, Identity, and Sexuality in the Levant, which examines Lebanon's nascent gay travel industry and particularly the gay subculture of the bear. The following year, JMU's published its first full issue dedicated, and I actually brought it to me, with me, to queering Middle Eastern cyberscapes. Um, it was guest edited by Adi Kunzman and Noor al Qasimi. And the special issue contains eight essays and interventions on Middle Eastern gay life in cyberspace, with cyberspace broadly defined to include the blogosphere, chat rooms, dating sites, Facebook, Flickr, YouTube, and a variety of other cyber forums. Although most of the essays focus on the usual, usual scholarly sites of Egypt, Iran, Lebanon, Turkey, and North Africa, Emirati scholar Nur al Qasimi's work focuses on the Arab Gulf, particularly the increasingly visible boyat, or lesbian butch subculture, and the accompanying baby lady, or hyper-feminized femme subjectivity, which can be found along the east coast of the Arab Gulf from Kuwait to Dubai. Although al Qasimi has become something of a lesbian scholarly celebrity for young women coming out in the Arab Gulf, her more recent work highlights the dangerous path that queer people still traverse, even in cosmopolitan spaces such as Dubai. In her forthcoming paper called Generations of Slow Death, Biopolitical Technologies, Queer Futurities, and the Psychiatric Management of Emirati Queers, which she's going to be presenting at the American Anthropological Association meeting in Denver this year, she describes the UAE's new amelioration of sin law, speaking of laws, which involves in part attempts to eliminate queerness in the UAE through psychiatric interventions and pharmaceutical prescriptions to regulate queer sexuality. And I truly wish that Noor were here with us at this conference, but her work in the Arab Gulf suggests the predicaments of gay people who are being forced into what she calls sex gender systems premised on reproductive sexuality, lineage, and continuity. So my own work in the Middle Eastern region over the past 30 years has focused on just that, namely sex gender systems premised on reproductive sexuality, lineage, and continuity. And I have to say, it's amazing. There are three medical anthropologists of the Middle East sitting together here. It would be Shireen Hamdi, who's got a wonderful book called Our Bodies Belong to God, and Saeed Atshan, who's done wonderful work on medical humanitarianism in Palestine. There are not very many medical anthropologists who work in the Arab world. But my own topic for many years has been infertility or the inability to have children. I've worked in Egypt, Lebanon, and the UAE, as well as the Arab enclave community of Dearborn, Michigan. I've interviewed hundreds of infertile women, hundreds of infertile men, and hundreds of infertile married couples in what I would describe as a relatively unique, unique form of marital ethnography. And generally speaking, Middle East gender scholars work in separate spheres. Women work with women, 
Men work with men, and this may be true whether we're working with straight or gay people in the Middle East. In the heteronormative world in which I've conducted all of my work, it's rare for ethnographers to actually sit and talk with married couples together about their intimate, reproductive, and sexual lives. As I've argued, more anthropologists should overcome separate spheres research to understand how men and women in the region interact, in marriage, in family life, and in the emerging gay community, communities forming in the region. So my own work has been largely concerned with the realm of marriage. And one of the things that I've learned via my work on infertile Middle Eastern marriage is that not all infertility is infertility if infertility can be defined as a biologically based problem of the female or male reproductive tracts. Instead, infertility may be masking impotency or the inability of a man to achieve and sustain an erection. In my earliest study on infertility in Egypt, I learned that 13% of the men who suffered from so-called male infertility were actually unable to achieve an erection and thus impregnate their wives. And in several cases, marriages had never been consummated, even though couples had been married for many months, even years in some cases. In my most recent study in the UAE, I learned that lack of marital consummation is a relatively frequent reason for presentation to IVF clinics among young Emirati couples. As one IVF physician explained to me, so many Emirati women have been deflowered by the vaginal probe. So, why this lack of marital consummation occurring in both Egypt and the Arab Gulf? On the one hand, it may signal an epidemic of impotence among young married men, particularly those who have no prior experience of sex and thus encounter erectile dysfunction in the marital bed. On the other hand, as the IVF physician herself suggested, it may also signal the lack of heterosexual sexual desire. In other words, young gay Arab men are still being forced into marriage in societies where marriage remains socially compulsory. Indeed, it is important to remember that marriage is socially compulsory in many Middle Eastern communities and is valorized as half the religion in Islam. Accordingly, Middle Eastern demographers, Abdul Omran and Farzana Rudi, have demonstrated that the Middle East is among the most married regions in the world, with upwards of 95% of all people entering marriage at some point in their adult lives. So where does this leave gay people? In many parts of the Middle East, it leaves them trapped in marriages not of their own desire or making. Families exert strong pressures on their children to marry, even in situations of economic duress. Parents want grandchildren to continue the family name, lineage, and for a host of affective reasons. Thus, as I've heard in my own interviews with young men and women, they may be forced to marry, even if they lack hetero desire. Furthermore, as Noor al Qasimi has pointed out for the UAE, Emiratis are outnumbered by more than eight to one by non-nationals. Thus facing the perceived threat of population extinction, young Emiratis are under extreme pressure to take up lines of prescribed genealogy and futurity, including marriage and family making. This is why I wager so many young Emirati brides end up as patients in IVF clinics, having never entered into sexual relationships with their presumably non-hetero husbands, who do not want to make love to them. With no other way of making a baby in the marital bed, the young bride seeks the help of an Emirati IVF clinic where she is deflowered by the vaginal probe. Her gay husband will be asked to come to the clinic to ejaculate his semen into a plastic cup in the clinic's bathroom, and then following washing and spinning, his sperm will be injected directly into the wife's womb via intrauterine insemination, or IUI. This will all take place in secret, beyond the gaze of the family. But if pregnancy happens, the family will rejoice, never realizing that a pregnancy has occur had, had occurred as a techno-immaculate conception, utterly without sex. To me, this is a sad state of affairs if the young wife is heterosexual and wishes that she could have a heterosexual relationship with her husband, and if the young husband is homosexual and wishes that he were not forced to be married, at least not to a woman. But what if both husband and wife are in fact queer and can use new reproductive technologies to their advantage? So this is where I would like to point to new queer imaginaries in the Middle East. My own work focuses heavily on the emergence of new reproductive technologies in the region. Indeed, the Middle East as a whole has one of the strongest and most robust IVF industries in the world. Egypt boasts more than 50 IVF clinics, Iran has more than 70 clinics, and Turkey has the largest number with over 110 clinics. Even small countries such as Lebanon and the UAE each boast more than a do dozen IVF centers. In these clinics, numerous assisted reproductive technologies 
are being practiced. Although the Sunni religious authorities require assisted reproduction to be practiced only within marriage, they have nonetheless allowed artificial insemination with the husband's sperm, in vitro fertilization of an egg from a wife with the sperm of her husband, intracytoplasmic sperm injection or ICSI using an egg from a wife with the sperm of her husband, cryopreservation or freezing of any excess embryos, eggs, or sperm, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis for couples at high risk of genetic disorders and their offspring, embryo research for the advancement of scientific knowledge and the benefit of humanity, and now that it is technically possible, uterine transplantation. Shia religious authorities furthermore have condoned third-party reproductive assistance using donor sperm, donor eggs, and donor embryos, as well as gestational surrogacy. So, the emergence of assisted reproductive technologies in the Middle East, particularly the use of intrauterine insemination and gestational surrogacy, has transgressive potential to open up new queer imaginaries of family making. Lesbian couples around the world have been using donor insemination and sometimes IVF to produce children who are biogenetically related to them and sometimes to their gay dads who have offered their donor sperm to their lesbian friends. Gay male couples around the world are increasingly turning to commercial gestational surrogacy, using their own sperm, donor eggs, and the services of a gestational surrogate to gestate their fetuses. This so-called gaby boom has taken off in the US, Canada, Australia, and Western Europe, as well as in Israel, which is featured in the recent documentary, Google Baby. With, while India has become the mother destination of commercial gestational surrogacy, including for gay dads, the industry of surrogacy is currently in a global boom, with new sites being opened up around the world. So this includes the Middle East. Indeed, Iran and Lebanon are the Middle East hub sites for third-party reproductive assistance, including a booming surrogacy sector in Iran. In Lebanon, surrogacy is much less common. However, clinics can discreetly arrange for couples to access surrogates who may be immigrant or refugee women living in precarious situations in the country. Whether gay men can access these surrogacy services in Lebanon remains unclear, given that, to my knowledge, all IVF clinics in the region still require heterosexual marriage contracts in order to use their services. Having said this, I can imagine a day when gay men and gay women in the Middle East will make common cause in order to produce their own gaby boom. If gay men and gay women who want to become parents are willing to enter into marriage contracts, contracts that are for real, even if romantic intentions are not, then gay men and gay women can fulfill their own child desires using marriage contracts for their own ends while still transgressing compulsory heteronormativity. I must, say, must emphasize that in the early days of gay activism in the US, gay men and gay women made common cause in helping each other to have children. The HIV AIDS epidemic thwarted these efforts to a large degree. But still, there are many examples of gay men and gay women who co-parent children to whom they are both biogenetically related. In my view, the future of queer life in the Middle East could include these reproductive and familial scenarios, even if it requires faux marriage contracts. Gay men and gay women could come together to have children through technologically assisted means, sharing in the joy of parenthood together while maintaining separate, separate lives of sexual satisfa satisfaction and same-sex desire. Do I have one minute left? Yeah. Okay, so to conclude in one minute. I believe that Saeed asked me to be part of this con conference not because I am an expert either on sexuality or queer imaginaries in the Middle East. Um, but I am the author of a recent book. It's called The New Arab Man, Emergent Masculinities, Technologies, and Islam in the Middle East. Um, and the book, um, some people have liked the book. It, it just won the Middle East Gender Studies Prize um, last year at Mesa. And so, and some people didn't like the book. But what, what is the book about? Um, it, it is, I can say, I believe I am the first anthropologist working in the Middle East to actually write an ethnography on Middle Eastern manhood. And since this book came out in 2012, two books have followed, one by Saeed's mentor, Fahad Ghanam from Swarthmore, who wrote Live and Die Like a Man, Gender Dynamics in Urban Egypt. And there's a forthcoming book by Nafisa Nagib entitled Nurturing Masculinities, Men, Food, and Family in Contemporary Egypt. These three new books represent an attempt to move Middle East gender studies in a new direction. 
not away from women's studies per se, but toward men as men in the Middle East today. In my own case, I offer the new trope of emergent masculinities to capture changing practices of masculinity in the contemporary Middle East. Emergent masculinities, in my view, encapsulate changes in men's bodies and subjectivities over the male life course, change over the generations as male youth grow to adulthood, and changes in social history that involve men in transformative social processes, such as the Arab uprisings. And in the Middle East today, emergent masculinities, I believe, encapsulate new gay subjectivities, as well as the formation of new gay communities of men who are taking to the streets in gay pride parades, at least in Istanbul this has happened, and they are definitely creating their own cyber communities across the region from Morocco to Afghanistan. And so we need to follow these forms of social, technological, and masculine emergence across the Middle East. As scholars of the Middle East, I want to say, as scholars of the Middle East, as scholars, as academicians, we are way, way behind, especially when compared to the engaged scholarship on both gay and straight masculine identity formation in regions such as Latin America, the Caribbean, South and Southeast Asia. And so I really see sexuality studies, including lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender studies as one of the major scholarly paths that academic academicians need to travel in the second decade of the new millennium. And I'm delighted to see that so many of you are now heading in this direction, both as academics and as activists, coming together here at Brown through the good work of Saeed to explore queer futurity and queer imaginaries at one of the most important times in one of the most important regions of the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Inhorn. I just want to remind everyone that um, to look at the illustrious bios of all of our speakers because we don't have time to um, speak them all. And our last presenter is Ilyas Wakim. Can I also introduce Madame Tayush? I didn't see that. Just a second, let me settle. Thank you. Sabah al khair, good morning. Can everyone hear me? <coughs> this work is just going to be in the background, yeah? Nothing to look at. Just to watch. Good morning, everyone. I'm a little bit excited, so I'm just going to take my time reading. Um, thanks you all for coming. Um, I want to thank my friends uh, who especially came from New York to be with us today. This is just amazing. And I know that a lot of people different, uh, came from different places in the world, apparently. Um, I like myself, by the way. So uh, I'm really happy to be in here with you all. I will introduce myself to you, and I will make sure to answer all your questions if there will be. But before, I have to thank my dear friend, teacher, and soulmate, Saeed Achan, uh, and I have to express my admiration to him in front of you, because he got me to speak in front of you today. I met Saeed once in my life, almost a year ago, where he showed up at the talk I gave at Harvard University, and he was one of a kind supporter, fully honest about how important was that for him to cancel work and come even though he had never, uh, he had never even heard about me before, probably. Um, at the end of the talk, Saeed hugged me very, very warm and promised to bring me back to the States. And here I am. Thank you, Saeed. Um, so my name is Elias Joaquim. I am uh, 42 years old 
Palestinian trans woman trapped in a body of a 24 years old trans human. <laughs> Currently, I'm finishing my BFAs at the Bitzalel Academy for Art and Design in Jerusalem. The main medium I use within my art practice is performance. Through performance, I examine the geography, history, and political situation of my experience growing up. I was born in 1990. The first rules that organized my life were strictly Greek Orthodox. Nothing could break those rules at that time, and no other religion could be better. I grew up in a very heartwarming and loving family, so I wasn't able to discover my own desires until the age of 17, when I left my parents' house in northern occupied Palestine and, no and moved to, lo to live in occupied Jaffa. From there, every, every belief connected to religion was shattered. Away from family, I could be anything I wanted. From being a monk in church, sometimes the priest, the best times as a nun. One of the first turning points in my life occurred when I realized that freedom of expression is all about the freedom of choose gender expression. Freedom of choice can be obtained through having awareness. There was no turning back for me. At that age, I also was very much conflicted with larger questions. Besides being a free human being, a free human being, I realized that being an Arab, being a Palestinian, is what was needed to understand that this freedom of expression was no longer valid at the place I was born at. So I started questioning my desires and thoughts about how I could evolve under those circumstances. I met ally, allies. I learned about Al Qaus, the LGBTQI Palestinian organization, and I started being involved in its activities. Until I got to the moment where I looked for more than just a safe space. I discovered art through meeting more people. I wanted to do performance so badly when I never knew what that is. And then drag came into my life. You know, you see the light. Madame Tayouche, Antoinette, and other names were given to me through artists, activists, and musicians. Many of those Palestinians were like myself, holding Israeli nationality, and they were resisting and expressing themselves through those creative practices. I fought my family to get to do what I wanted. They, sur they surrounded me with lots of confusion and hatred, but acceptance came only when they realized that they will lose me if they don't respect my desires and my choices. Coming out trans calmly and without too much noise made sense for me not only because of social norms within Palestinian society, but also Israeli society. They couldn't wait to hear an Arab announce him or herself in Israel as a homosexual. A Palestinian queer saved by Israel. In other words, to promote specific kind of human rights propaganda, which we call pinkwashing. As a Palestinian who was born inside the borders of the apartheid state of Israel, I understand well that no matter how much comfort I can find within the Israeli society as a homosexual, I will never find it as a Palestinian. I don't need the permission of the Israeli state to live out of my sexuality or identity. I want to pose a few questions. What does, it, what does identity mean? What that, can that be changed? What do multiple identities look like? What is it like to be a trans woman? And what is it like to be a Palestinian? To answer those questions, I want to share some thoughts with you. It is extremely difficult, sorry, a second, let it go again. It is extremely difficult to be a Palestinian in a world that dehumanizes Palestinians, that confuses our nationality with Arabism, Islam, and terrorism. Those three words are used, are used frequently in the same sentence. When you can't even dare challenge an Israeli without being labeled anti-Semitic. When I tried to raise my voice against fascist settlers in East Jerusalem at a nonviolent protest in 2009, I was jailed for doing nothing standing in the street and documenting political unrest. I was later released without any charges. How surprising was that? 
Well, it wasn't. Avigdor Lieberman, the foreign minister of the State of Israel, said a few years ago, all Arabs should be thrown to the Mediterranean Sea. How did Bibi Netanyahu and his political party, Likud, convince people to support him for a fourth uh, term as a prime minister? Well, he said, all Arabs are voting this election, and if we, the Jews, don't do anything about that, we will lose everything. In every sense, Netanyahu performed his victory. I want to consider Jerusalem with you for a moment and remember all those trans people who have been discriminated against because of sexual orientation and gender identity. They are martyrs in the same way as those Palestinians experiencing daily oppression. Now, here we go with the fun, with the fun part now. I just, I will need you to cooperate with me, please. Um, uh, this is a call and repeat. I didn't finish. <laughs> I spoke to my mom yesterday, and she asked me to pray and light candles for Easter. She still thinks that I will you know, go back to church someday. She has no idea that, you know, that's already over. Uh, in fact, I want to thank my mom for reminding me about that. Um, but I am going to light those, uh, I'm going, I'm sorry. I want to thank my mom for reminding me to light those candles, and I want to light those candles, but not for Easter. I want, to lose, I want to ask you all to stand up with me for a moment of silence to remember all of those Palestinian bodies that have been lost and forgotten after this last massacre in Gaza and throughout history. Total. The last thing that I'm going to do is to pass around a candle um, and I would ask you to pass it between you all folks um, and, I, and, I, and I suggest that you pass it with a meaning. Thank you.